Venezuelan and Russian presidents meet in Moscow to discuss bilateral relations and pressing international and regional issues. A new study warns that more than one billion are at risk due to climate change. And the British Parliament resumes a sitting a day after the Supreme Court ruled its suspension unlawful. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo and this is From the South. On the margins of the UN General Assembly, the U.S. President Donald Trump met with members of the Lima Group of Latin American countries to discuss their campaign against Venezuela. The Venezuelan Foreign Minister gave Telesur his response to the meeting. It's, it's the puppeteer with the puppets, telling them what to do. Um, and of course, they are all really frustrated because they have tried all year long to overthrow our government. It has been a continuous coup. They have sanctioned and uh, they have imposed all this blockade against the Venezuelan people and they haven't reached their goals. They haven't achieved their goals and they won't. So it's really Trump trying to distract the, the public opinion of his own scandals and it's about his political campaign as well. His face, the face of Trump, he, it was, his was like disgusted. He didn't like to be there, no? maybe because he doesn't like the Latin Americans. No? Su cara era de asco, no le gustaba estar en esa reunión. But, of course, he has to use Venezuela like Colombia uses Venezuela and other countries use Venezuela in order to distract the public opinion and not to concentrate in their own issues, in their own problems. So that's, that's the real truth. And uh, we hope that someday the United States, the elite that rules in the United States, learns to respect not only the Venezuelan people, but all the Latin American peoples. And we can have a relation of mutual respect and political tolerance and ideological tolerance. We hope if President Trump or his government wants to have dialogue with the Venezuelan government, our hands are opened and we can have dialogue. If they respect us, we will respect them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our correspondent Jorge Gestoso has more on the meeting. There is a meeting this morning here in the area of New York with President Trump and what is called the Grupo of Lima, a group of uh, Latin American countries that are really helping and pushing the oust of President Nicolás Maduro of Venezuela. So they're going to officially and theoretically, they're going to brief President Trump about the situation regarding uh, President Maduro and Venezuela. And the manipulation of the information is trying to put in the, in the mind of the President of the United States that it was President Maduro that withdrew, was canceled, what blocked the conversations, the dialogue in Barbados about the conversation with the opposition. And therefore, with that litany, they are going to suggest to increase even more the pressure, the sanctions against Venezuela. So they're going to try to paint absolutely the opposite situation of the reality when we know that the reality nowadays continue the dialogue, at least with certain part of the opposition with President Maduro and the government of Venezuela. The idea, according to the experts, is the sabotaging of that dialogue in order to justify more sanctions, probably the activation of the TR agreement to eventually justify a military intervention. The idea is to put pressure and pressure and pressure, and in order to put pressure, they have to create a narrative that justifies the pressure. The narrative, therefore, yesterday this Grupo de Lima was meeting with the European countries that also are in the same boat with President Trump and themselves, saying exactly the same misinformation, that is responsibility of the President Maduro and Venezuela not to talk with the opposition when, when in reality is absolutely 
the opposite. We thank Jorge Gestoso for that report. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has called on the United Nations Security Council to take decisive action to end India's almost two months lockdown on Kashmir. Addressing the UN General Assembly, Khan said the world should not stand idle while the situation in Kashmir worsens. Indian and Minister Jammu and Kashmir have been on lockdown since the beginning of August when India stripped the region of its autonomous state. If ever, if ever the Security Council has to move, it's now. And I'll say for two reasons. One, the people of Kashmir are suffering simply because the Security Council could not implement its decision to allow them the right of self-determination. The 11 resolutions. So it's their responsibility. Eight million people are locked inside for 50 days. It's inhuman. So what is the Security Council for then? How do you reason with what they've done in Kashmir? I mean, would you expect a civilized society to do what they've done and locked in eight million people? So therefore, I'm worried that if this goes on, this, there can easily be a miscalculation. And that's why the United Nations must act. Electoral observers and experts are beginning to arrive in Bolivia to accompany the elections set to take place on October 20th. With one month to go, the first European Union electoral observation mission has arrived. The mission will continue until the conclusion of the electoral process, and during its time here, specific reports will be made that will certainly be made public as they are completed. The European Union mission plans to carry out one of the most thorough studies of the whole Bolivian electoral process, which includes an exhaustive survey of the opinion of different sectors. We have begun an intense program which will include meetings with the main authorities, political leaders and civil society representatives. So in the coming days, this long-term mission will follow the whole Bolivian electoral process very closely. Meanwhile, the political opposition is trying to discredit the election process. They have already attempted, without success, to mobilize citizens to push Evo Morales to abandon his candidacy for re-election and to get members of the electoral court to resign. Beyond the current elections, I think they are going to try to undermine the process and take a position like that of the civic committees and claim to be defending democracy, whatever people decide at the polls. With less than one month before people go to vote, the opposition is spreading doubts about the election and insisting that there will be fraud, fears which could be countered by these international observers. Bolivia has a system which is based on electoral boards, and observers from each party are able to see all the voting records as soon as the polls close, so that they can check the validity of the results. This is what the international observers have to oversee, and that's why they are here. This will be the first election in which the electoral register is audited by the Organization of American States. One of the demands of the opposition, the latest opinion polls indicate that Evo Morales will take first place and be re-elected in the first round if he maintains his current lead of more than 10 points over the former president, Carlos Mesa, who is in second place. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Venezuelan and Russian presidents have met in Moscow to discuss bilateral relations and pressing international and regional issues. President Putin has reaffirmed Russia's commitment to carry on fulfilling the military technical agreements signed years ago with Venezuela. And he has also assured President Maduro of Russia's support to the legitimate Venezuelan government and authorities, as well as the dialogue with the opposition. And of course, we are actively cooperating in the international arena. You know that Russia consistently supports all legitimate authorities, including the Institute of the Venezuelan President and that of the Parliament. And of course, we support the dialogue that you, Mr. President, your government is conducting with the opposition forces. We consider any refusal of dialogue to be irrational, harmful to the country and bearing only threats to the welfare of the Venezuelan people. We always support legitimate authorities, 
And I think we have proved that we can jointly overcome any difficulties. We support established cooperation in all areas. Last May, a meeting of the high-level commission of our countries was held, and many of the issues discussed at this commission were successfully resolved. We are talking about a number of areas, food, healthcare, energy, and many other areas. Therefore, today's meeting is very important. We can take stock of what has been done this year in order to see what problems we still have, what realities we are facing, how progress is being made in a number of areas, and make plans for the future. We always feel very comfortable in Moscow and are always happy to be here. On Tuesday, Chavista lawmakers in Venezuela returned to the opposition-controlled National Assembly. It was part of the agreement signed last week with sectors of the opposition to unblock the political deadlock. Revolutionary lawmakers arrive at the National Assembly in Caracas to retake their seats. They withdrew two years ago when the opposition majority defied the Supreme Court and decided to admit three of their candidates whose election had been marred by fraud. As a result, the court declared the assembly in breach of the Constitution. The session was a turning point. The Chavista members will try to help the assembly overcome its breach of the Constitution and recognize the other powers of state. This is part of the agreement signed last week with that part of the Venezuelan opposition which opposes military intervention, coups and economic sanctions. All things that the parties backing the self-proclaimed president, Juan Guaido, have supported. We are making this political gesture to open up debate, to open up the way for dialogue and constitutional solutions for understanding, so that the different powers of the republic can resume their proper roles. That is why we are here. The aim is to break the political deadlock and restore the political institutions, according to the opposition members who signed the agreement. This reincorporation certainly gives the assembly an opportunity for dialogue for debate between the different ideas. Each side can strongly defend its positions, but then we can take decisions for the good of Venezuela. One of these decisions has to do with achieving the necessary quorum to elect new members of the National Electoral Council. Time is against them. Elections to the Assembly are due next year. However, the extremist opposition insists that President Nicolas Maduro should step down. and There should be a presidential election, which is not in line with the Constitution. We will work to make this body work and work well, to overcome this body's breach of the Constitution and to prepare for the parliamentary elections in 2020, when we will go out and campaign for the vote of our people. But the opposition objected to the presence of Chavista lawmakers who accepted other government posts while they were away from the National Assembly. If someone accepted another government post, they lost their seat. Although it's true that the Constitution says you lose your seat if you accept another public position, it is this assembly that decides on its members, and this assembly is in breach, and the ruling on that breach says that all its decisions are illegal. The Constitution is clear that the final decisions on such matters rest with the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court. You are wrong, and those who took other posts are no longer members. That's final. This assembly is in conflict with the other powers of state, and I ask the people of Venezuela who are accountable to, how can the country move forward when those who are meant to solve problems cannot agree to sit down and work within the framework which applies to everyone, which is the Constitution? It will be the constitutional chamber that has to solve this dispute. We are not going to get stuck in this debate. All of us here were elected by the Venezuelan people, and as elected lawmakers, there is nothing to negotiate. The cards are now on the table, and Juan Guaido's term as president of the assembly is also running out. 
Following increased geological activity over the weekend, citizens and foreigners are warned against visiting the mud volcano in Piraro, Trinidad and Tobago. The volcano is located in a central village in Trinidad. Residents have reported cracks on the roadway with damage caused to at least one house. The Ministry of National Security says it is working with key stakeholders to monitor the situation while the police service has held a meeting in the village to roll out an evacuation plan with safety guidelines. The area has been cordoned off to prevent entry. Guyanese are waiting with bated breath amid a speculation that President David Granger will announce an election date today. A brief government statement said Granger met with cabinet and discussed the holding of free and fair elections at the earliest possible time. This would adhere to the ruling of the Trinidad and Tobago-based Caribbean Court of Justice, which upheld the no-confidence motion in Guyana's government in June. The president will address the nation at a time to be advised. In Mexico, non-governmental organizations have expressed dismay at the anti-migrant speech delivered by Donald Trump to the 74th United Nations Assembly. Migrant rights defenders rejected the threats by U.S. President Donald Trump against those who seek asylum in the United States after fleeing from poverty and violence in their home countries. Migrants are a result of failed regional policies that have forced them to leave their countries. And now the same governments behind those policies want to shift the blame to the millions of innocent people. There has been criminalization of those who support migrants on their journey to the U.S., a policy that has been widely used in the United States since the election of Trump as president. Trump claims those who provide support to migrants are encouraging human trafficking in Mexico. The migrant defenders are suffering from increased aggression, harassment and criminalization of their work. The situation has become more complicated for those who try to cross the territory to reach the U.S.-Mexico border without documents. The measures that they are using to criminalize migration have also affected those who accompany and give humanitarian assistance to the migrants. They have also made it easy for governments to accuse migrants' defenders of engaging in human trafficking. The deployment of the National Guard and officers from the National Migration Institute to Mexico's southern and northern borders has reduced the flow of migrants by up 58.7% according to figures from the Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Despite the accusations, President Andrés Manuel López Obrador's administration says the enforcement of the new migration laws is being done in a manner that respects the human rights of migrants and are also implementing a joint development plan with other countries of the Northern Triangle to create more jobs in the Central American region. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. The, the British Parliament has resumed a sitting a day after the Supreme Court ruled Prime Minister Boris Johnson acted unlawfully in suspending the House of Commons ahead of the October Brexit deadline. At the end of August, Johnson advised the Queen to prorogue Parliament for five weeks to allow his government to bring a new legislative agenda. Supreme Court President Lady Hale ruled that the move was unlawful because it had the effect of frustrating or preventing the ability of Parliament to carry out its constitutional functions without reasonable justification. The Prime Minister is expected to speak. Meanwhile, British Attorney General uh, Geoffrey Cox labeled the parliament a disgrace and said the government would be asking the opposition to agree to an election shortly. Cox said the move is a means to resolve the impasse over Britain's protracted exit from the European Union. This parliament is a disgrace. Yeah. Given, given the opportunity, given, since, since I let me tell them the truth. They could vote no confidence at any time, but they're too cowardly. They could agree to a motion to allow this house to dissolve, but they're too cowardly to give it This parliament should have the courage to 
to face the electorate. But it won't. It won't. Because so many of them are really all about preventing us leaving the European Union at all. But the time is coming. The time is coming, Mr. Speaker, when even these turkeys won't be able to prevent Christmas. The United States has imposed sanctions on Chinese companies for allegedly buying Iranian oil. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says sanctions are being placed on state-owned Costco shipping and other Chinese shippers and also on their chief executives. This comes as France tried to arrange a meeting at the United Nations between U.S. President Donald Trump and his Iranian counterpart Hassan Rouhani to de-escalate tensions. The Nigerian army has closed four offices of international aid group Mercy Corps in the northeastern region of the country. Later, Mercy Corps announced it's suspending its operations in the states of Borni and Yobi due to the army's action. The military reportedly closed the offices after finding almost $10,000 in cash being transported in Borno State by a driver who said the money belonged to Mercy Corps. Northeast Nigeria has been the region worst hit by militant group Boko Haram, which has killed at least 30,000 people and forced 2 million to flee their homes over the last decade. A new study by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warns that over a billion people living in low-lying or high mountain regions are at risk due to the phenomenon. The report finds that warning, uh, warming oceans and fast-melting ice sheets could lead to a one-meter rise in sea levels by 2100 if carbon emissions keep climbing. This is 10 times the rate in the 20th century and will have catastrophic implications for people and ecosystems. But but the IPCC report highlighted that urgent and radical action may avert some of the worst possible outcomes of the climate crisis. Wednesday marks the 56th anniversary of the military coup in the Dominican Republic, heavily backed by the United States, which ousted then President Juan Bosch. The ousted politician, who had championed the cause of the rural working class, was an opponent of the dictatorial regime of Rafael Trujillo. Juan Bosch Gaviño, a distinguished intellectual, ascended to the presidency on February 27, 1963. He was the first democratically elected president in his country after the execution of dictator Rafael Leonidas Trujillo. At the outset of his term and even before his inauguration, Bosch faced strong opposition from the oligarchy, allies of the military, and from within the highest ranks of the Roman Catholic Church. The church was angered by the secular nature of the constitution Bosch authored, while other sectors were at odds with him over the worker-oriented many social programs he proposed. Bosch's contribution to his country's political development was of paramount importance. The most vulnerable in society also stood to benefit under his leadership. During his tenure, Bosch established the 1963 Constitution, which protected workers' rights and provided the formation of free trade unions. Bosch refused to bow to pressure from the U.S. and the Dominican far right. He often clashed with powerful economic, religious and military groups that had been supporters of Trujillo's dictatorship. These forces, in complicity with the U.S. Embassy in the Dominican Republic and the Organization of American States, OAS, helped coordinate the coup that saw Bosch removed from power on September 25, 1963, just seven months after he had taken office. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesorenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesor English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.